Creative Bible Study Tuesdays. Let's stand. Invite the presence of the Lord. All of a sudden, it sounds like if my mic gone. Yes? One, two, one, two. Okay. Precious Father, we bless you, we honor you, we thank you, O oh God, for this day that you have made. We thank you, O oh God, for the privilege of coming into your house to sit down, O oh God, and to just learn of you, O oh God, to just be in your word and to have you impart truths, O oh God, into our hearts and into our spirits. And precious Lord, we ask, O oh God, that today, Lord, that we will not leave the same way that we came in, but let your word wash us. Let your word, O oh God, instruct us. Let your word, Father God, help us in every area of our lives. We just bless and we thank you, O oh God, for this opportunity again. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. You may be seated. So welcome to Bible Study Tuesdays. And we are continuing our study, Understanding Salvation, um, where we are studying Galatians and related scriptures. Um, so last week, we did the second part of verse 19, chapter 3, verse 19 of Galatians, because we did verse 19 in two parts. And the second part spoke about um, that the law was ordained or administered by angels. So we took the opportunity to speak a little bit about the ministry of angels. And so we looked at how angels were active in the Old Testament, but we look more so because our interest has to be, how are they active now in this New Testament? And so we saw that, you know, they are ministering spirits and that they are called to minister to us, the saints. Yeah? So today we're continuing in Galatians chapter 3. So we're just going to read from verse 18 just to take us in. And we talk a little bit about that. We have some interesting stuff today. Hopefully I get to it. So Galatians chapter 3. Let's just read from verse 18 and come down. So it says here, For if the inheritance be of the law, right? We, and we know what our inheritance is, the promise, everything that Jesus came to give to us. And so if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. He says, wherefore then serve at the law? Why do we have the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. And we saw that that mediator was Moses. Verse 20 says, now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. So, 19 is a nice segue into verse 20 because it says that the law, meaning the, and we know what the law is, is the Ten Commandments, is all the instructions that they got concerning tabernacle, everything. Everything how to live in the Old Testament is considered the law. And it was, God used Moses. So Moses was, when it says a mediator, it's a go-between. So Moses was the go-between person. He was the, um, the arbitrator, so to speak, between um, God and the people of Israel. Because you'll ask yourself, the scripture is saying that he's a mediator. He says, now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. So the question that they're asking then, then who is he mediating between? Yeah, because it can't be God and himself. There's, you don't, if you're going to have a go-between, there must be two parties. So basically, it's telling you that the two parties is God and Israel. So Moses was that go-between. He was that mediator between God and Israel. Right? So God was speaking through Moses to make his will known to the people. And we know that even when God was inviting the people to come, come up to the mountain and come and, and hear me, they were like, no, 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 we will just listen to Moses. You talk to Moses and we will listen, we will do what Moses says. They didn't always do what Moses says, but we know how that goes. Right? Um, so Moses was that middle man, so to speak. Galatians, let's look at... Let me just read Galatians 19 to 20 um, in the Amplified, just to amplify, right? It says, and just the second part of um, verse 19, I'm reading, it says, And the law was ordained through angels and delivered to Israel by the hand of a mediator, Moses, the mediator between God and Israel, to be in effect until 
the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Now the mediator or go-between, this is how the Amplified is saying it, now the mediator or go-between in a transaction is not needed for just one party, whereas God is only one and was the only one giving the promise to Abraham. But the law was a contract between two, God and Israel, its validity depending on both. So what they're basically explaining there is that when God gave the promise to Abraham, the promise, he did not need a mediator there for the promise. God himself being one, he made that promise. Yeah, he made that promise to them. But when it came to the law and what they're trying to show is the, the difference between the law and the promise. Remember when he gave that promise, that promise is to do with Jesus. And remember we spoke about the fact that that promise was given way before Moses came in, right, before it had anything to do with Moses, when he said that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through Abraham, that promise was made before Moses ever came up with the law. So we're seeing the difference between the law and the promise. And so he's saying that God by himself gave that promise, but when it came to the law, he, the, he needed a mediator. There had to be a mediator, and that mediator was um, Moses, right? So in other words, it says its validity depended on both. So what you found with the law is that God would use Moses to say, if you do this, I will do this. If you do, and that's basically how the law went. You do that. If you don't do this, what I say, I won't do this. Or I, you know, or he will act in some way. That was how the law was, right? So it was a means to keep. And we spoke about that, that the law was really this placeholder. The law had nothing to do with the promise. So just think about in this space of time where God made the promise that one day all the nations of the earth would be blessed, that Jesus Christ would come, that there would be this covenant of grace, you know, there would be this, uh, all of that. All of that was promised. And then the people, because of their transgressions, he said, listen, we're going to have to put a law in place to keep them on a track until this promise comes to pass. Yeah? And so that's what the law had to do. But the law has nothing really to do with the promise. Nothing to do with the promise. So, so if there was not going to be that portion of time, we would have gone straight from promise into what we have now with Jesus Christ. If God had given, sent Jesus Christ at the time when he made Abraham the promise, there would have been no law. There would have been no need for the law. We would have gone straight into Greece. Understood? Yeah, I know this could get a little, and so, right? So, but it means, so the law was a placeholder. So under the law, God said, if you do that, I will do that. So it was a means to keep the people aligned until the fulfillment of the promise. Now, I don't know how it skipped me to read this part of verse 19 in the Amplified Classic Edition. And that's the first part of verse 19. And I'm just going to read it in the Classic Edition because it just, everything that I've said, it just makes it clear in the classic edition. You know what it says? What then was the purpose of the law? Remember, we answered that a few weeks ago. What's the purpose of the law? This is how the Amplified Classic Edition says it. It said it was added later on after the promise to disclose and expose the men their guilt. So it exposed the men their guilt. Man would not have known that they were guilty before God if they did not have the law. Stating, this is what you should do. This is the benchmark. When you did not do the benchmark, then you knew that you were guilty before God. It says, um, because of transgressions, right? So this is one reason why the law, why the law was added um, after the promise. It says, one, it was to disclose and expose to men their guilt. It says, because of transgressions, and this is the other reason it was um, given because of transgressions and also to make men more conscious of the sinfulness of sin. Now it's interesting the way they put that, the sinfulness of sin. Because you need, you know, you know when we become lax where the things of God is concerned, then sin does not feel sinful. You could be in sin, but it doesn't feel sinful. And you'd be like, well, I didn't feel anyhow. So if you are not able to be in touch with the sinfulness of sin, you will bypass certain things and just skim over it, not realizing the impact that it has really on your soul. 
and on their spirit. But the law helped them to understand, to be conscious of the sinfulness of sin. So that at least you know this is something to stay away from. It's like fire. You see fire. But when you put your hand close and you feel the heat, you know the heat of fire. Yeah? So the sinfulness of sin cause you to know. So you know, don't put your hand in the fire because there's the heat of fire. There's also the sinfulness of sin that you need to be conscious of so that you don't go there. Right? So the Lord did that for them. It says... And it was intended to be in effect until the seed, the descendant, the heir should come. All right? So I just wanted to make sure and bring back that verse for us so that we would, um, it, it, it says it nice in, in a nice little nutshell. So it's pointing out how different the law is from, from the promise because the promise of, there's the promise of grace through faith. In Jesus Christ. Always have to bring us back to that. What we have achieved in Jesus Christ coming is that we now have access to grace, to faith in him. Totally different from the law. There's no grace coming from the law. No grace has afforded us where the law is. The law is dot your, dot your I, cross your T. There's no grace, there's no leeway. Your legal systems work like this. This is the law. You break the law, this is the penalty. That's how law works. Grace, however, allows you that you're failed, but there is grace applied so that you could make your way back. Yeah? Good. I like to repeat that, you know, because I know how easy it is for us to just lose touch because we go from not fighting up to fighting up. Not fighting up to fighting up. We, it's constant with Christians. You have to be reminding yourself all the time because we like legalism. Yeah? Tell you, fall in love with Jesus and have faith in him. We don't know how to do that, but tell you, cross your dots, uh, um, dot your eyes and cross your teeth. I could do that. <laughs> yeah? You're doing it yourself, you could do that. But have faith in Jesus and see how grace flows into your life. We don't know how to do that. <laughs> yeah? All right. And this is what Apostle has been trying to teach us for years. Intimacy with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because when you get that intimacy, it makes this journey way easier. Because you're trusting Him. You're having faith in Him. You know that everything that you are, you have nothing beside Him. He's your hope. He's, he's your everything. We say it, but we don't always live that way. We beat ourselves up a lot instead of getting back into Christ. Just get back into Christ. Yeah? We have, a, we have a lot of pride as Christians. A lot of pride. Because pride is what causes us to keep going back. Whereas humility causes us to stay. Is the truth. Yeah? So Jesus now, we know that Jesus is our mediator between God and man. And we see that in First Timothy. Let's look at First Timothy chapter 2 from verse 4 to 6. So there we had Moses being the mediator for the law. But when Jesus came now, there was need for a mediator between us and God. And Jesus became that mediator. He had to qualify for that position of mediator. All right? First Timothy 2, we read from verse 4. It says, Who will have all men to be saved? Speaking of Jesus. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth? It's important to remember that God would like all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. It is not his desire that any should perish. Yeah? His desire is, is not so much this whole thing about his desire is for you not to go to hell. It's more about his desire is for you to be with him. Yeah? We make everything about hell. We sent our whole Christianity on hell. When really, your Christianity should be centered on Jesus and what he's offering, you know? But we like to scare ourselves into things, but then the Lord, his whole kingdom is supposed to operate by love. But we prefer to go the route of fear rather than the route of love. Yeah? When you understand what the Lord has done, it, it draws you. But his desire is that all men be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. It says, for there is one God and one mediator, one go-between, one mediator between God and men, and that is the man, Christ, Jesus. 
no other mediator. It doesn't matter anybody that they tell you, go talk to them, to talk to God, you know that you're not on the right track. It says there's one God and one mediator. If you come to talk to me, to talk to God, you're using me as a mediator. The scripture says that there's one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Christ, Jesus, because he qualified for that position. I did not qualify for that position. Now, that is different, really, though, than saying, asking somebody, could you pray for me? Now, you're praying for them because what you're doing is standing in the gap for them, stuff like that. But when you see somebody as the person that could talk to God for you, like you feel like you cannot talk to God, and a lot of Christians tend to feel like, Apostle have a direct line to God. This one have a direct line. So you don't know how to deal with anything. You're not coming to the Lord. Because remember, the Lord is all about relationship. So if you keep using somebody else to talk to God, because you don't feel that you can, it's different from asking somebody, could you pray for me? You know, could you lift this up to the Lord for me? But you're supposed to know that you can come before God as well. Very important in Christianity. Yeah? Because there's one mediator, there's one person. You go to Jesus and he is standing there ready to take whatever we have to give it over to the Father. He qualified for that position because when God looks, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So we could approach unto, unto him and God will receive from him because he stands as righteous. We don't stand as righteous, but he stands as righteous. Amen? So we could go to Jesus literally with anything. Yeah? With anything. We have to stop living this fake Christianity where we're trying to have all the right words or to fix ourselves up good before we could go into prayer to talk to the Lord. You're trying to sort out everything before you could go to God. Go to Jesus with anything. Your worst thoughts, your worst behaviors, your, your, your innermost things. You could go to him with anything. He's the righteousness. Yeah? Carry it to him. No matter how filthy it is, don't listen. We so ashamed sometimes to admit, you know, what we are, what we have, what's going on in us. We don't even want it to come out of our own mouths, what's going on. And the Lord is like, who exactly are you hiding from? Because he's saying, bring it, bring it to me. Why hide it? Why try to camouflage it? There's nothing hidden before God. Everything is uncovered. You know, but it is important to him for us to make that confession. You see, when the scripture says that um, confession is made unto salvation, salvation is deliverance. Yeah? So it's not just about your soul being saved. Confession is made unto salvation. So a lot of times when we are able to confess, speak what we have done, we free ourselves. Shackles are broken. And we're able to free ourselves because salvation comes because you made a confession of it before God. Amen? And there are times even when the scripture tells us that you could confess your faults one to another. Why? Because when you confess your faults, it says that, and that's not for gossip and for you to say, oh, you wouldn't believe what so and so do. Right? Confess your faults one to another. And it says, and pray one for the other because there is deliverance and salvation that comes when you confess i tell people all the time i tell the young people all the time the devil hides in your secrets sometimes you need to have at least somebody as a confidant somebody that you feel you could say i am struggling with this i need help could you pray for me Somebody that you could be honest with because in the confession, imagine the devil is there hiding in the secret. He's like, nobody knows. This is our little secret place. And he stays there. And you're wondering, how am I not getting free from this? It's because you have created a cozy place for the devil to live. For the demon to live. He lives in the secret. But when you expose the secret, and I'm not telling you, go on national TV. You know, everybody have to go on TikTok and everything to think the, the secret. You don't need to go that far, right? But when you expose it, the enemy now is like, so where are I supposed to live? <laughs> yeah? You have another secret I could go and live in. You have something else. Where am I supposed to stay? Because he is empowered when we are not willing to confess. 
when we don't want to speak it. He loves when we are so ashamed. Listen, there's a whole demon of shame, you know. A whole demon associated with shame. And he loves when we, uh, we, we, we harbor that shame. Shame has companions. And so he's able to get other people in. Once we are harboring shame, he's able to say, fellas, door open, come. Shame is here. Pass here. Pass here. I have a back door. Yeah? The back door is shame. And all these things. Yeah? So it, it, you, when you understand this demonic kingdom, run to Jesus with anything everything tell him i didn't realize that i had all this jealousy where this thought come from why am i competitive well tell him because he knows you want to change you confess it breaks amen didn't plan to say all of that that's why i can't get through my bible study okay. right but he said but there's one god and one mediator between god and men the man christ jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time he paid the price to get that position. Yeah? He gave himself for that. So, when I think about Jesus and what he has done for us, the magnitude of it, it really blows my mind. I've been reading Hebrews. And when you start to get into Hebrews, and Hebrews actually supports, if, if I only started to get into scriptures in Hebrews, we would have moved off a study in Galatians and we'd be in a whole study of, of Hebrews. So, I'm just going to pick some because really it is such a great support when you read from from chapter 3 all the way down to chapter 10 you will see how well it paints the picture of what jesus did for us even as mediator yeah what he did for us so it really blows your mind when um and what he because when you look at it you see that jesus is he's our high priest he's our advocate our intercessor our mediator but you know it's not just that and i mean those are big roles high priest is huge our advocate huge he is like the lawyer in the courts of heaven making a case for us because if you look at us at face value they'll say mm, they're looking so good for you but when you have jesus advocating for you that's how we make it because he was he's showing look at my hands Look at my feet. Look at my back. All the blood that I shed, it was for this purpose. Yeah? So that all of their transgressions, the transgressions that would have been made under the law, Jesus Christ was able to wipe out those transgressions. So any transgression now, he's able to wipe it out. So he stands as that go-between and that advocate for us. So that's huge. He's our intercessor. Why would somebody intercede for another? Because they realize that they need to bridge a gap. They need to pray for somebody else so that they could get a breakthrough. That's what Jesus does for us. Just like the Holy Spirit. Remember, we spoke about the Holy Spirit being intercessor as well. Yeah? So they are fighting for us. Feel loved. He's our mediator. But do you understand that Jesus Christ was also the sacrifice? Think of him as the high priest. The high priest takes the offering of the sacrifice, takes it in to offer for the sin of the people. But Jesus was the high priest, but he also was the offering. So imagine he's high priest, but he's the offering. So he is the lamb that was slain, and he's taking his own sacrifice and his own offering and giving it for us so he is a sacrifice and he he is also the high priest that's so huge he's that when it says that jesus christ is your everything is not overemphasizing right so, but but do that as homework some people are always saying i don't know what to read i don't know what to read go and read hebrews chapter three four five six all the way down to ten <laughs> yeah read it and you'll be enlightened so he fulfilled every requirement of of righteousness so that he is the only high priest, the only righteous high priest, because there was never a righteous high priest. He was the only righteous high priest, and it says, after the order of Melchizedek. Now, what is the order of Melchizedek? We're going to get, we're going to talk a little bit of that, because it was a particular kind of high priest, and Jesus Christ was the only one. There was only one other that 
held these positions that Jesus will hold. And that was Melchizedek, right? And I'll tell you why in a bit, right? So Jesus could make an offering for sin and not have to make an offering for his own sin. Yeah, he did not have to make it. So he is the ultimate high priest. Hebrews chapter 5 from verse 9. Jump there quickly for me. Hebrews chapter 5 from verse 9. It says, And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Perfected in everything. He was that sacrifice. Verse 10 says, Called of God, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. So Melchizedek was a, a high priest. He was a king of Salem, and he was a high priest that Abraham met when... I remember at what point Abraham met him. But Ab there was some... They plundered some place. That, was it when... Right, yes, yes, he had slaughtered some kings, that's right. He slaughtered some kings and he had spoil. And what he did when he met Melchizedek, he gave him the tenth part. He paid the tithe to Melchizedek. But Melchizedek was a king, but he was also a high priest, right? So here it is, Paul is telling these people. And remember, for these Hebrews, they are Jews. And it was so important for him to get them to understand because they understood who the high priest was, they understood the role of the high priest as a mediator to go in there to give the offering on behalf of the people for them to be covered, for their sin to be covered for a year. He'd have to do it again the next year. But they understood that. So when Paul, well, they're not sure if the writer of Hebrews was Paul, but I would say Paul for the sake of argument, right? Um, when Paul, or the writer of Hebrews, is talking about Jesus Christ being the high priest. They have a vivid picture of what Jesus had done for them. Right? And he said, after the order of Melchizedek, they also understood that. He said, of whom? He said, I want to tell you more about this high priest and it being after the order of Melchizedek. He said, of whom I, we have many things to say. And hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. Hear what Paul is telling them. He says, and in the Amplified it says, concerning this point, because it's so huge, concerning this point, we have much to say. And it is hard to explain, since you have become dull and sluggish in your spiritual hearing and disinclined to listen. So this is what, this is scripture, this is not me. You know, if I come and say, people dull are hearing and you're disinclined to listen, it'd be like, what wrong with Reverend Martinez, right? But, but the writer of Hebrews said that they want to tell you about this, but you're, you're not at a place to receive it. Do you know that there are times when there are things that the Lord wants to say to us, but we're not at a place to receive it? He's trying to get us to a place because you'd be like, how I was you know, like this all the time, and why didn't God just tell me? Just tell me, you know, tell me I'm lukewarm. You know, people say, why God didn't just tell me I'm lukewarm? Because you can say lukewarm, 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 and if you at a place not to hear it, you don't hear lukewarm. In fact, you will hear the word lukewarm, and you look around to say, oh, who lukewarm, boy? <laughs> yeah, because until you're at a place to hear certain things, the Lord cannot speak it to you. So there are even revelations of himself, things that the Lord would want to share with us. But he knows that we're not at a place to receive it. Yeah? Paul literally told them, he said, I look in to give you all some meat and I realize you all still on milk. I could only give you milk. You have no teeth yet. You don't know how to navigate the whole thing to be able to chew this and for it to, to, to mean something to you. He says, so I'm going to have to just give you milk. Yeah, but interestingly, after he told them this in chapter 5 of Hebrews, when you jump over to chapter 7, you realize he started to expound on Melchizedek and the high priest and so, because it has to be that they might, remember these letters not written all in sequence, huh? 
So it seems like between the time that he told them this, and then in chapter 7 where he started to expound on Melchizedek and the high priest and, and help them to understand that thing, they had gotten to a place where he said, ah, I could give you some meat now because you're able to receive it and you're not going to take it in any negative way, right? So understanding this whole idea of Christ being the high priest was critical to their salvation, but he said that they were dull of hearing. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 9 from verse 14. We are already in Hebrews, I think. So Hebrews 9, 14. It says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, because he spoke about the bullocks and stuff and the blood that was done for them. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, he had to die, by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. The first testament was the law. He said there were transgressions that were committed under that first testament being the law. Jesus Christ had to die to redeem them from those transgressions. He says they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, or meaning a contract, where a contract is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator, right? In other words, he's saying, once there is this thing this, um, that you're mediating, there's an agreement, somebody has to die. There has to be the death. If there's a will, the will cannot go into um, action until the person dies. It does not get, it doesn't have any value. It doesn't matter what they said they're going to give you on that. They could give you a house, a car, whatever. There's no value to it for you until the person dies. Yeah? And so basically that is what they're bringing out here. So um, when you read that in the, Amplified, in the Amplified Bible, it says, For this reason, he's a mediator and negotiator of a new covenant. He negotiated a whole new covenant. That is an entirely new agreement uniting God and man. That's what Jesus did. So that those who have been called by God may receive the fulfillment of the promise of eternal inheritance. Since a death has taken place as the payment which redeems them from the sins committed under the obsolete first covenant. For where there is a will and testament involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. His sacrifice had to be made that our sin, so Jesus Christ made the sacrifice that our sin is not just covered, but it's taken away. That's what Jesus did. Every time you commit a sin, you go to Jesus, it's not covered, it is taken away. It is blotted out. You understand that? If you fall now, and you repent, you go to Jesus, he blots it out. This is why when you come in back and saying, Lord, remember last week when I did so and so, he does not know what you are speaking about. He chooses not to know what you're talking about because he blotted it out. He's like, why are you going, I blotted this thing out, and you go and rehearsing this again. It's done. It's finished. Move on. Yeah? We have to learn to move on. Anytime you find yourself camping, at the sin that you commit, that is pride. You say, Lord, how could that be pride? It's pride because you're still there thinking, how could I, how could I? When you understand the fallenness of flesh, yeah, you're not all shocked that this thing happened, but more so when you understand what Jesus Christ did for you, for you to be still harboring and, and, and dwelling on that, you have not humbled yourself to just receive what he has done. You still there thinking, you all that and some, and you, you know, you need to just understand, flesh is fallen. And as we did with the dual man, the dual nature of man, sin dwells in that, in that flesh, man. And if you don't do what you're supposed to do to make sure that you're walking in the new man, you could end up fallen, falling. But when you fall, you have an advocate. 
You have one who is standing there, ready to blot it out. That is why the believer should never be in condemnation. Never. Not if you do it the way that God says to do it. If you fall, and I'm not saying that to be so careless that you're just falling down, getting up, falling down, getting up like you have dropsy, right? It's, it's, it's not that. But the idea is that there's no time that sin is supposed to remain with you because he's ready, he's always ready to blot it out. He doesn't have to go and die again to blot it out. It's available. You just go and you accept by Jesus Christ. You accept, you accept. So we should be walking without spots and blemish all the time if we live in that place. If you live in that place. Better yet, if you live in the new man. If you, live, if you walk in the spirit, walk in your new man. You shouldn't have to be falling down, falling down, falling down. But anytime you fall down, run to him. Amen? So he did that for us. And the, the scripture says in Hebrews 10 and verse 14, don't turn to this one, it says, For by one offering, one offering he had to make, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. One offering. He has perfected forever. You come to him, you get washed, perfected forever. Them that are sanctified. We got sanctified. Every time any spot comes, you go back to him. Go back to him. So if we are doing that effectively, you don't have to be afraid of the rapture. It's supposed to be ready. We're supposed to be ready. You know, if we do that, because you can fight up all you want and be like, oh, I just want to, and I need to be ready for the rapture. And the day you, you fall, budup is the day it comes because you're living in fear instead of living in Christ. Yeah? Live the life. Forget about it. thinking, I wonder if it's because the eclipse, when the eclipse comes, I wonder when the eclipse, if this is when, you know, the rapture is going to take place. So you're all ready for the eclipse. And the eclipse pass, and they say, huh, it didn't come. So I could send the day, budup. And I can't say Buddha, but and then he comes. Yeah? So it's best eclipse, no eclipse, whatever going on. Stay ready. <laughs> yeah? Stay ready. They have some people that stood up people to the point that people were ready. Listen, they're watching the eclipse and they're like, is this it? Is this it? Come on. You know? Live in the Lord. We want to go to spend eternity with him. And we want to transition from loving him here to loving him there. So if you're going to be, you know, schooling yourself in anything or practicing anything, practice loving him. Because that's what the, you're just going to transition one to the other. The same Lord that you're loving here, you're going to love when you're there. If you don't love him here and all you're doing is watching hell, hell, hell thing, how are you transitioning? Your whole mind had to change now before you could live in God's heaven because all you do, all you know about is hell. You know nothing about God. Yeah? And I'm not saying that it's, it's, it's not important to know that there's a hell, know that there's a fire, the worm that died not, know all these things, but fall in love with Jesus. Some of us more in love with hell and the stories of hell and the devil and everything that the devil could do more than we are with God and what God does. <laughs> yeah? Important, important. Because we are Christians. We're not devilans. <laughs> Devil devilians. <laughs> I don't make up a word. We are not de devilians. We are Christians. We are followers of Christ. Amen? Yes, so Jesus also made it that because of Jesus, because of him, we can approach the throne of grace. You understand, when it says the throne of grace, that it literally means the place where grace is dispensed, you come to a throne where grace is dispensed. That is what you get when you come here. Grace is dispensed here. So Jesus, because he fulfilled everything he was supposed to, he made it that you could come no, to the throne. Whereas, and that throne of grace, which we know is like the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies, where they understood now that this high priest that we used to go in behind the veil to make this transaction for us, Jesus made it that we can come through the veil, they said, which is his blood. We can come and we now could come to the throne of grace to get grace. 
to be able to live, to get mercy, to be able to, to, to live and to, do the, to live this life, to live this Christian walk. If you are trying to live your Christian walk without grace, you are following the law. You have not found <laughs> the beauty of Christianity. If you, do, if, you have, if you don't understand grace, you have not found Christianity. Because we live by grace. Yeah? Grace is how we are able to do what we do. So it is a place where grace is dispensed. And we know that scripture. Oh, but what I want to point out. You know, we always read Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. But let's read from verse 15. Hebrews 4 and from verse 15. Hear what it says. We're there because we're supposed to be still in Hebrews. Yes? Hear what it says. It says, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He could feel everything that we feel. All the weaknesses, all the struggles, all the things, the mental anguish, the everything. He is acquainted with it, right? We don't have a high priest who is disconnected from that. That is why Jesus had to come in the flesh. He had to walk in flesh. God had to come and walk in flesh so that he knows what it feels like to be flesh. Yeah? If you create something and you don't know what it is to be that, you, you really can't relate to them. Jesus had to come and walk in flesh, go through the temptations, go through all of it to know this is what they feel like. God, through Jesus Christ, got to understand what man feels, how man thinks, what, how the whole system works. Because he walked in it and he had to come and walk in it because he had to qualify as a man to deliver man. He had to qualify. It's the only way. It was really the only way. That's why he said, Lord, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. But he knew there was no other way. Nevertheless, let your will be done. Because man had to suffer in flesh to deliver us that we don't have to suffer in the flesh so that we could be redeemed. So it says, we don't have a high priest. That's going in there. In the past, the high priest is going in there. Knowing he has sinned, just like you, he has to go and make the sacrifice, hoping it will be received and all that. So he was acquainted with the people because he had sinned too. But our high priest felt everything that, he, that, that we go through. He says, but was in, it says, touch with the feelings of our infirmities. But was in all points tempted like as we are. He had to go through all of it. Yet without sin. Yet he did not sin. And so he qualified. And he said no. Because Jesus did this. And because that is our high priest. He says let us therefore. You know what they say? When you see therefore. Know what it is therefore. Right? And Reverend Dalton always says that, but I hear Derek Prince saying it as well. Right? Let us, we need to know what it's there for. It says, let us therefore, because we have a high priest who has been touched with the feelings of our infirmities, because we have a high priest who was tempted in all points, just like we are tempted, yet did not sin. Because of that, we now could come boldly onto the throne of grace. You see? Because Jesus fill in, he fill in all the roles. You, you ever saw those westerns where you go into the city and when you meet this person, they say, I'm the fireman. They put on the fireman cap. Time you walk down the road, you see the man who, who in the bar. You see the same man, he put on the, the, the barkeeper um, hat. You go somewhere else, he's also that. This is Jesus in the scene. <laughs> he, all the caps. So you go into the holy of holies, and you're going before the throne of grace, and it's Jesus Christ on the throne of grace, dispensing grace. But he's also the high priest that made it possible for you to be able to come to, to receive from the throne of grace. He's your advocate. When you want a lawyer, he's your lawyer. <laughs> you need a mediator, he's your mediator. He fills all the roles. Yeah? Amazing, really, when you think of it. So he said, because of this thing, we could come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He qualified for this for us. And that is why you could come boldly. Anytime you're feeling like I can't approach unto God, remember that you have a high priest. That because he felt all of it, he was able to dispense grace. Grace came. 
because Jesus knew it would take grace for them to be able to overcome. He said, because I went through it, I understand that we need, this place needs to be a place where grace is dispensed. Because I've walked in flesh, and I know that they cannot do it without our help. They cannot do it without the empowerment that comes from the Godhead. So he made that now into a throne of grace. Come and get what you need so that you too could be yet without sin. Yeah? Get what you need. Amazing. I mean, I don't know. I'll be all excited all by myself reading these scriptures. And I'll be like, oh my God, you know. Um, thing. But I don't know if you all get the picture. Just when I think about what Jesus did for me, I get excited. I do. I get excited because that's a big deal. You did it all. But here the thing now where I really want us to go. Because that's not all he did for us. The fact that the scripture said that Jesus was a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now some people, they, Melchizedek was a mysterious man. When you read in the scripture, they said they didn't know his beginning, they don't know his end. He, they, they didn't know his age, they, they just didn't know he was a mystery, right? Yet what we do know of him, he was the king of Salem and he was a high priest, right? The only one of his kind that was also, that was priest and king. So when it says he was, the, it was the order of Melchizedek, meaning that Jesus held the role of high priest and also king. How is that adva advantageous to us? I was teaching the young people on Saturday when we had our youth prayer. I was telling them about a, a, that in Israel, what they did, they had these places called cities of refuge, right? The city of refuge. So they established all of these cities in close proximity. They, they had them in different points that wherever you are, you should be able to run to a city of refuge. And I'll explain to you what that is. When you look at um, Exodus chapter 21 and verse 12, um, if you could find it quick. No, well, I read it from the Amplified Classic to just make it easier. So make a note. Exodus chapter 21 from verse 12 to 14. Hear what it says. Whoever strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. But if he did not lie in wait for him, meaning he wasn't there, it wasn't premeditated. If he did not lie in wait for him, but God allowed him to fall into his hand, then I will appoint you a place to which he may flee for protection until duly tried. He said, I will provide a place where they could run, flee to for protection. He says, but if a man comes willfully upon another to slay him craftily, you shall take him from my altar to which he may have fled for protection that he may die. He said he may have fled to this place for protection, but you know he did it willfully. You could take him from the place and so he, he will die. Joshua chapter 20 and verse 1. Hear what it says, Amplified Classic Edition. So this now is giving you a little more idea of this place where he was saying that they could flee to. It's a city of, of refuge. It says from um, chapter 20, Joshua 20, from verse 1, it says, The Lord said also to Joshua, Say to the Israelites, Appoint among you cities of refuge, of which I spoke to you through Moses, that the slayer who kills anyone accidentally and unintentionally may flee there. And they shall be your refuge from the avenger of blood. Because remember, if you kill somebody... Whether it's by accident, their family or whoever looking for you now, because remember in those days, there's eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, right? So they're coming after you to kill you. So he made this place for them. He says, he who flees the one, verse 4, he who flees the one of those cities shall stand at the entrance of the gate of the city and explain his case to the elders of that city. They shall receive him to the protection of that city and give him a place to dwell among them. 
Now, it may not come out here, but they had the Levites were the ones who were in charge of all of these cities. And they made sure that they were all accessible, right, from, from wherever they were dwelling. Different cities, but they had Levites living there. And so the priests really were, were there, and they would be the ones to have to receive them. All right? So it says, if the avenger of blood pursues him, they shall not deliver the slayer into his hand. Because he killed his neighbor unintentionally, having had no hatred for him previously. And he shall dwell in that city until he has been tried before the congregation and until the death of him who is the high priest in those days. So when the high priest died, he would be free to go. It says, then the slayer shall return to his own city from which he fled and to his own house. Now, so as I said, these cities of refuge would have um, temples of God, tabernacles, and so it will have um, altars unto the Lord. And these altars would have what they call horns at the altar. It will have these horns at the altar. So that when they talk about this person fleeing and coming to this place, they will flee and they, when, when, if they know that their avenger is coming for them, it, they will go to the altar and they will hold on to the horns of the altar because once they are holding the horns of the altar, no, the ra no random person could come and just slay them. They cannot touch them while they are there. All right? The priest would allow them in because remember the priest is there to protect them until they tried. Right? The priest would allow them in. But the only person that could give the okay when somebody is holding on to the horns of the altar could give the okay to slay them still even though they're holding on to the horns was the king. Whoever was the king. So the priest is giving you access to the altar and for the protection. But the king could say whether you are pardoned or not pardoned. So they have a couple stories in the Bible. One of them is about a guy called Adonijah. And Adonijah, he was the fourth son of King David. And when he knew that King David was about to die, he was a spoiled child. You see like how Absalom, when you read about Absalom, Absalom was a good-looking man and everything, but he was spoiled. David loved him to the point where he spoiled him, but he was not the only one that David did that with. David did that with this guy, Adonijah, as well. And when you do the, the research on him, they said Adonijah was very handsome. Absalom was also very handsome, and he had hair like no other. They said his hair could be pulled, and it was like a real you know, sight to be seen. But Adonijah was also very handsome, but he had no behavior. And the scripture says, if you look in 1 Kings 1 and verse 6, you don't have to turn there. But the scripture says that King David had never disciplined him at any time. Sometimes we could love our children to the point that we don't discipline them. No punishment. I love you too much. You're too cute. Yeah? We live in vicariously through them. You're too cute to be punished. Yeah? But you create a monster. Because Adonijah knows nothing about him. It says in the scripture, it says that he had never disciplined him, even by asking, why are you doing that? It said David never did that. So that is one of David's failures as a father. But the scripture says because he was so own way, he told himself, he knew that it was rumored that Solomon was to be anointed king. But he decided... David was dying, and he gathered about 50 guys and things, and they went and they started to celebrate, and he tell himself, the throne is mine, right? And Joab, which was one of David's main men, he was the head of the armies, and so David trusted Joab. Joab had seen him through many, many, many things, right? When Absalom, which was one of David's sons, that, you know, um, rose up against him, when Absalom had turned against David, Joab stood firm with David. He did not go after Absalom, right? Even though Absalom was conniving. Yeah, and listen, you can have some children that break your heart, you know. They break your heart. Imagine Absalom plotting for his own father to overthrow his own father. He didn't care if his father die or not. Eh? He's plotting to overthrow his own father. Yeah, and all of that. You see, when you spoil your children, you create your own monsters. 
And then these monsters now, you're trying to cage the monster. But some people trying to cage the monster after the monster grown up now. The monster have fangs. He have claws. You know, the monster ruling the whole place. Now you're saying, now you're pulling out a belt. And saying, you know, you take too late. The monster now will eat you alive because you created that monster. Listen, even in marriage, you always go, of course, where are What's it that? Even in marriage sometimes, people create their own monsters. You don't teach people how to love you. Yeah? So you create your monster. And then when you end up with a Vashti, yeah? You know in the Bible, Vashti, that's how Esther got a place. Because Vashti had no behavior, no manners. But guess what? The king had created that monster. Because Vashti had a say in everything. Right? So when the king had guests, and he sent for Vashti, come and think. She's like, I'm not coming. I don't agree with what you're doing. And I'm not coming. Embarrass the king in front of everybody. Women need to know how to behave themselves. Know how to conduct yourself. When you go out. <laughs> Even when you're home. Know how to conduct yourself. Because she embarrassed the king. And they told him, they said, listen. They said, king. If you allow Vashti to get away with this, because everybody knows that you sent for her and she didn't come, you know what we will have to deal with when we go in our homes? Our wives will now think that if the king's wife could decide she's not coming, when we talk to our wives, they will feel that they don't have to do anything. So the king now had to say, Vashti will no longer come before me. And that's how Esther gets a little in. You see? That's how Esther got in there. So, so I say all that to say, sometimes you create your monsters and then you can't cage it. Because he allowed Vashti to do all sorts of things. Then when he wanted to cage it, monster out. Yeah? So, anyways. So that is the story of Adonijah. But there it is now. Adonijah is there and he's celebrating with the guys and he's saying he's going to be king. Next thing he hear trumpet. They're hearing a set of commotion going on. He said, what is going on? And they tell him, David just anointed Solomon king. Once the king anoints a successor, you know you're in treason. Yeah? You are in rebellion because he never anointed you. You anoint yourself. Yeah? And so when that happened, he started to shake in his boots. We pick it up from 1 Kings chapter 1. Jump down to verse 50. So 1 Kings chapter 1 verse 50. And hear what it says. Because he heard all the commotion and he's telling himself, oh my God, I'm in trouble. It says, and Adonijah feared because of Solomon. Now before that, he wasn't afraid of Solomon. As far as he's concerned, who is Solomon? Solomon is Bathsheba's son. Don't even deserve to be there. That is why he felt he should have the position. Because as far as he was concerned, Bathsheba um, was David's um, sin partner. Right? They know how he got there. And yet still, look who God chose. Listen, when we write enough people in this life, look at how God has anointed them and exalted them. Because they, the other brothers, probably looking down on Solomon all the time and saying, look at that child of sin. Yeah? Their mother was better. My mother here before your mother and whatever and thing. Listen, this, this um, whole... How they used to live, God help them. In our day, you feel, you, you understand why God say one husband to one wife? You understand the tant and nobody will make it to heaven. You only there fighting up with the other wives all the time. Who making it to heaven? Yeah? It's a competition all the time. I cook. You see, you see when I cook, he ate. But when you cook, he didn't eat. Yeah? It's competition. My children better than your children. You see, my children do better in school than your children. And they, competition all the time. Everybody going to hell. Busting hell wide open because nobody. Yeah? And all this competition is over what? T to please one man. Look at an Abraham own house. <laughs> Abraham own house. When the maid, Hagar, when she got a child, surely watch it up, Sarah. I'm the one. I'm the one who have a child. You don't have no child. Yeah? And she, she make it take it till Sarah is like, put her out. You see the confusion? All of that would have been going on in the church. Sarah is telling Abraham, 
put her out. She only given me the eye. And what kind of thing? Put her out. She can't be here and whatever. And here, Abram, oh Lord, what I would do with these women. That's why men, if you don't want stress, have one wife. One wife is enough. Any man will tell you it is enough. Yeah? I don't know how men have a wife. You have a whole wife home and you're going outside to, to, have, to take up other troubles. You understand why some of them, they drink, they do all kind of things they're doing because you're where God said one wife. He said you only have the capacity to handle one wife. Yeah? Too much trouble. Time to now. But anyways, so we get into the scripture. It says, so Adonijah feared because of Solomon and arose and went and caught hold on the horns of the altar. So he would have fled to one of these um, cities of refuge, right? And he went and he held on to the horns of the altar. And verse 51 says, And it was told Solomon, saying, Behold, Adonijah feared King Solomon. For lo, he hath caught hold on the horns of the altar, saying, Let King Solomon swear unto me today that he will not slay his servant. All of a sudden, now he's his servant. That he will not slay his servant with the sword. And Solomon said, if he will show himself a worthy man, because remember Solomon is now king. The priest allowed access, but Solomon is now king. He said, if he will show himself a worthy man, there shall not an hair of, his, a hair of him fall to the earth. But if wickedness shall be found in him, he shall die. So King Solomon sent, and they brought him down from the altar, Brought him down from the altar, and he came and bowed himself to King Solomon. He was still full of all kind of things. If you read on all these stories, you will see. But he bowed himself to King Solomon, and Solomon said unto him, Go to thine house. That's the power of the king. Now, Joab, as I told you, was supposed to be King David's main man. But when Adonijah... Jump up and decided to do his own thing. Joab supported him. Yeah? He supported him. Because Joab as well probably never agreed with um, Solomon being made king. Yeah? He had his own feelings about that. And he probably felt that why Bathsheba should be, you know, the exalted one and whatever. So he had his own feelings and he sided with um, Adonijah. But listen to the rest of the story here. So verse, 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 28, it says, Then tidings came to Joab, because Joab now voting for Adonijah, right? So it's a whole thing. Who voting for who? He not voting for Solomon. He voting for Adonijah. It says, Then tidings came to Joab, for Joab had turned after Adonijah, though he turned not after Absalom. And Joab fled unto the tabernacle of the Lord and caught hold on the horns of the altar because he realized that he betrayed David, his friend, was his friend and also his king. And so he held on to the horns of the altar. It says that it was told King Solomon that Joab was fled unto the tabernacle of the Lord. And behold, he is by the altar. Then Solomon sent Benat. Benaiah, I didn't christen him, sent this guy, the son of Jehoiada, saying, go fall upon him. Now, when they say fall upon him, it really means wipe him out, right? Because even though he was ready to pardon Adonijah, Joab, was, that was blatant. It was betrayal, right? He said, fall upon him. And that guy that he sent came to the tabernacle of the Lord and said unto him, Thus said the king, Come forth. And he said, No. He said, Nay. But I will die here. <laughs> he said, If the king wants to kill me, he will have to kill me here. I am not letting go of the horns of the altar. And Benaiah, or whoever he is, brought the king word again, saying, Thus said Joab. And thus he answered me. And the king said unto him, do as he had said, and fall upon him and bury him, that thou mayest take away the innocent blood which Joab shed 
from me and from the house of my father. He said, kill him right there, holding on to the horns of the altar. That is the kind of authority that the king has. It says, and the Lord shall return his blood upon his own head, who, who fell upon two men more righteous and better than he, and slew them with the, with the sword. My father David, not knowing thereof, to wit, Abner the son of Nur. So apparently he had done some things, which is why he was probably hoping that Adonijah won the vote, right? Because if Solomon won the vote, Solomon was going to deal with him for the death of Abner and whoever else he had killed, right? It says, captain of the host of Israel and Amasa, the son of, of Jether, captain of the host of Judah. Their blood shall therefore return upon the head of Joab and upon the head of his seed forever. But upon David... And upon his seed and upon his house and upon his throne shall there be peace forever from the Lord. And look at verse 34. It says, so Benaiah, the son of that fellow, went up and fell upon him and slew him. And he was buried in his own house in the wilderness. He killed him right there. And the king put Benaiah and that guy in the room of the host and Zadok. Because Zadok the priest also had gone after they would, they were, it was a whole betrayal thing. But the point we're making here is, so Jesus as high priest does not, it does not only give us access to the city of refuge. He is the city of refuge. Yeah? He is our refuge. Yeah? When you read Psalm 91, the Lord is our refuge. Yeah? So Jesus, he is the city of refuge. He is also the high priest that gives you access. That makes it possible for you to be able to come to the city of refuge. And guess what? Because he is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, he is also king. So he's high priest and king. And because he is king, when we fail, when we fall, whether... Now, they said if it was unintentional or, you know, whatever, then they will try the case and they will have refuge there until they try the case. But hear the extra part with Jesus. Even though we are guilty, when we are guilty, because there are times when we sin and it was not that accidental. You knew that if you went there by yourself to study, yeah? To, to, to read your Bible, both of you all alone, in this little corner, it wasn't all that accidental. Right? So, so, but, look at Jesus. He says, run. Listen, and I was telling the youth this. I said, when you sin, these people, when they know that they kill somebody and they know that they will be coming for them, listen, they know one time, make a beeline. For the city of refuge. Because you don't want the avenger to catch you. Before you could get to the city of refuge. So they would start to run for their lives. To the city of refuge. And once they got there and they got access. They knew they could breathe. I made it. They can't touch me here. At least until trial. So when we fail. Even though you're guilty. He's saying, run to the city of refuge because the high priest has made it possible for you to enter into that place. But he is also king. And so when you lay hold of the horns of the altar and you are crying out to him and you're saying, Lord, I am sorry for my sin. He is king. He has the authority to say, you are pardoned. Even if you are guilty. Even if it was premeditated, and I'm not saying to practice premeditated sin because that is a heart condition. A heart condition, there's iniquity resident in a heart that willfully goes into sin. And that's a different ball game. We have to be, be careful of iniquity. It is a stain. Yeah? So even after you commit a sin and you've asked forgiveness and that's forgiven, if you don't deal with that residue of iniquity, you, that sin will come up again. 
All right? So this is the beauty of who it is. And I wanted us to see this, that when we talk about um, Jesus Christ being a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, it's because he is not only priest, high priest, standing for us, making an offering for us so that sin doesn't have to remain with us. He also is able to say, you are pardoned. You are pardoned. So no matter what you do, run to him because he is your refuge. Your refuge and your fortress. A believer really should not be walking and living in sin. There's no reason to be keeping sin. No reason. If you going to sleep with sin, and I heard somebody say today, and I know the time passed. Go there, reach 740. I know the time passed. I heard somebody say today that when the scripture talks about not letting the sun go down on your wrath, it is, the, when they talk about these elements, they were talking about um, that in the beginning, God said, let there be light. But the, that light came before the sun after he said, let there be light, then he said, and let there be the, the, the major light being the, the greater light being the sun and the lesser light being the moon. There was no sun and moon yet when he said, let there be light, because that was his light. That's why in the new Jerusalem, you don't need light because it says he himself is the light of the new Jerusalem. They don't need a moon and you don't need a sun. Yeah. Do you know that literally the atmosphere that we live in now? So this is one of the things when you talk about with the rapture of the church. And you know, we talk about the Holy Spirit possibly not being here at all. But I could tell you one thing that could, that could be lifted. You see that light? They could still have the sun and the moon. But you see that light that is in the world that people don't even recognize. That there is a peace that comes with that light of God, with God still being in the, in the world. There's a peace that comes with that. There is somewhat of a covering. That's why the devil can't just run upon you and just do whatever. Even before you came to the Lord, there is that protection still there. I found that was mind-blowing. But he was talking about don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Because when the sun goes down on it, there's that that. Everything to do with the moon, he's saying. The, the devil likes to use the moon, lunatic. Lo all those things have to do with the lunar, which is the moon. And so you find that a lot of attacks and so come. And the witches and so, they like to use the power of the moon and the whatever and thing. That's why I said, if you let the sun go down and the, the moon come up on what you did, there's that demonic um, activation when the, when the moon comes up. On your sin, that could make things worse for you. Yeah? I was just hearing that in passing today. But guys, let us understand who Jesus is to us as high priest. He has made the sacrifice. Use it. Use it. Do not sit down and wallow in sin. Do not be in living, living in sin on a daily basis. Not when that price has been paid. And that's why I said there's no other sacrifice to be made. He cannot be crucified again for your sin. So if you don't receive this, you can't go looking for another sacrifice. Jesus is it. Amen? So let's stand. Because first, first, um, memory verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9, which is, For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. Remember that we are laborers together with God. And he's looking for laborers in the harvest right now. Yeah, so we went a little bit over, but tomorrow is a holiday. Yeah, so nobody can stone me. That's why I'm not ducking down between the, behind the altar here. You can't stone me. You can sleep late tomorrow. So I took a little 15 minutes liberty. Yeah, let's pray. Precious Lord Jesus, we just want to honor you and thank you and bless you for being who you are, for understanding us, oh God, as human beings, for coming in flesh and being tempted and being tested in every way that we are tested. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for understanding the weaknesses of flesh, for understanding, oh God, the challenges that we have. 
And thank you, Lord Jesus, for making grace available to us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for creating a city of refuge for us in yourself. That we don't have to keep sin. That we don't have to, Lord God, come under the power of the avenger, of the devil himself who wants to come after us and to accuse us. And Lord God, to, to condemn us, oh God. We should never be condemned because you made yourself a city of refuge. That we can come and we can lay hold of, of the horn of your altar, Lord Jesus. And we get grace. We get grace to help. In time of need, we get mercy as we need it. Because Lord Jesus, you are constantly making a case for us in the courts of heaven. We bless you and we honor you that the devil does not have rights to us, oh God. Because of what you did, Lord Jesus. We can defy the devil because of what you have done for us, Lord Jesus. And even when we open a door to him, we can run back to you, oh God. And that door has to be closed. We bless you, we honor you, we thank you for this great salvation that you have made available to us. Open our understanding, O oh God. That we will not be dull of understanding, dull of hearing, so that we could really lay hold of the truth of what you have done for us and that we will live in it. That we will love you for it and we will live in it and we will walk in it. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. So God bless you all. It was a pleasure as usual. Have a fantastic day off tomorrow. And we see you the next time you come for the weekend. So God bless those of you online as well. God bless you. Introducing the Know the Truth series by Dr. Austin DeBoog. It will open your eyes to God's truth on four misunderstood and misrepresented Christian teachings. Saints Conferring sainthood upon dead people contradicts God's word. Communion Infinitely more than a mundane ritualistic tradition. The Church God's Church is not a man-made religion. And Praying versus Saying Prayers Praying as Jesus taught is not just reciting someone else's words. If you think wrong, you will believe wrong, and you will act wrong. Too many of us are accepting wrong Christian beliefs. This blinds us to the truth of God's infallible word and robs us of God's abundant blessings. This book series challenges you to take a closer look at what you've been taught. It will revolutionize your thinking. It is time to know the truth. See